I'm Fathery. This is Dave. This is Brian. And this is Text Trek. Engage. So welcome back aboard the Starship Texas for the 98th installment of the Tex Trek podcast, the home of Star Trek fandom from deep in the heart of Texas, where we talk all about Star Trek all the time. And today we are going to discuss the eighth episode of Star Trek Picard season one, Broken Pieces, written by Michael Chavin and directed by Maya Vervillo, which is almost certainly not how you pronounce that name. Uh, d- directed, um, directed some uh, short track and some disco season two, okay. and also uh, two episodes ago on Picard, I believe. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, those are our creatives. We also have the the showrunner who has a writing credit on almost every episode. And yeah. I think has been doing a, a pretty great job running the show that I am thoroughly enjoying. And I'm sad that he will be gone in season two. Other than him making me want uh, to throw everything into the gutter once or twice. Uh, I've, I've quite enjoyed the ride. Uh, and, and we're like almost there. We're, we're what, eight out of ten? Am I right? Yeah. I think this might be the best run of episodes without a stinker in it that Star Trek might have ever had. Uh, TOS had a pretty strong... No, I, I take... Yeah, there's, there's been eight episode runs before that have been pretty it's, good. It, it is a little hard to compare because their format was so different. They yeah. were like, here's a crazy new idea, here's a crazy new idea, here's a crazy new idea, every, each episode. I, I, every, I, would, I would be challenge, challenge you to come up with ten episodes in a row. Now, we haven't seen maybe the last two episodes of Picard suck, but, <laughs> any, but assuming they they maintain this quality, finding ten episodes in okay. a row uh, the, the, where none of them was a stinker. That could I, be reasonable. No, I think that's easy to do. I'd say any ten in DS9 season six uh, are gonna be some, so, I bet you're gonna hit a Ferengi episode I love the Ferengi uh, episodes those are stupid Alamarine <laughs> that was in I, season I, one I and, season and, one. That, and I like uh, all, and, uh, all the I, way home I was just throwing it because I knew it would like, sort of wound you yes I actually like the twist at the end of that but I think it doesn't quite justify its running time anyway <laughs> well um, let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about this episode Broken Pieces okay we're each just going to give a opening statement, just our general impressions of the episode, and then we'll go on to discuss it in great detail. But um, I'll, I'll go ahead and go with my opening statement, I guess. Uh, this episode, I, I didn't love it as much as last week. Of course, last week was my favorite episode of the show, but I, I really dug it. Uh, this did exactly what I thought it would probably need to do going into, and that is give us uh, much more revelations about... The, the the history of the show the the mysteries the the cause of uh, the synth attack on Mars and give us a little bit more into the Zotvash origin all these things that we've been wondering about that they've been drawing out it uh, gave us a lot of info on that uh, there's there are probably still some more that we can learn in the remaining two episodes um, but it, I, I thought they needed to address that at this point in the season. And also it set up the, the big two-part finale that we're going to get uh, starting next week. Uh, the episode was do you very... Think, do you think it was a housekeeping episode? Um, I, absolutely I, a housekeeping episode. I wouldn't use that term because... We don't want it to be pejorative because well, it's a really... like. Well, we, I thought it was really good. We got good character scenes. This was like a, a, a slower pace, more like chatty show. But it was... It, there wasn't a lot of plot in this episode. There's a few right. plot points that occur, but only like three or four things. Right. The B plot stuff the, on the, on the board yeah, cube yeah. is probably the most plotty. Yeah. And even part. there, the, the, I mean, like you add all those scenes together, that's like what, like five minutes. Yeah. So there wasn't a ton of things that happened in this episode. It was more of just uh, these these character scenes 
that uh, I, I I thought all really worked. There were a couple things in here. I would argue I, that there is stuff that happened. The dynamics and the relationships between the characters changed fundamentally in many cases. Yeah, but you can describe so. it all in like three or four bullet points. Yeah. Um, so I, I felt like uh, a lot of the stuff worked. There were a couple things in here that I was actually like, oh, really? You're going to do that? But uh, they're uh, trivial in the bigger picture. Interesting. Dave, what about you? Uh, one of my favorite episodes overall, um, uh, there was also 100% less Hugh death in it, although I did see it in the, in the previously on portion, so that was a little bit of a pain uh, in my heart. But other than that, um, almost every scene in it was some scene I liked. Um, and, and that, that goes a long way with me when I'm just like, every scene I was like, oh wow, oh that was a, oh interesting, didn't expect that. Um, I think the biggest quality it had for me was that it took several characters that were, I don't want to say I was like uh, on the fence about, but they hadn't like kind of blown me away yet. And I'm talking about Dr. Drati, Rafi, and the villainous of the piece, uh, Nerissa. Nerissa. Your favorite character, I believe. My favorite character. Especially after last week. Especially after last week. But they actually managed to do some scenes with her that gave yes. her some depth in it and that I liked. Uh, and I thought Rafi and uh, Dr. Gerardi both got some great scenes in it. You, sh- you should say that you actually like hate Narissa for people who haven't listened uh, to our yes, previous conversation. Yes, that was sarcasm going on. Yes, I feel like she is a cheap one-note villain pre- previous to this. It wasn't actually like not offensive or anything, just like for being the person who got to kill Hugh, who is like a, a really nicely rounded character... Uh, with a with a cool history dating back, you know, what thirty years is it? This character should not get that privilege. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> for, uh, for for this this episode, they gave her something more to do than quasi seduce her brother while being mean to him. You know what's, <laughs> what's interesting about her is the showrunner said that they really liked her performance at the table read when they first started making the show, and so like they wrote more and more stuff for, for that actress to do as Nerissa. Uh-huh. And I actually really enjoy her, even though I was weirded out by the Romney Lannister stuff, and I'm glad they backed off of that. Yeah. But whenever she's on screen, I'm always kind of intrigued and interested. And I think part of that might be I just think like the actress is cute. And sure. I probably need to like admit to that that I'm I'm being in no way objective about this. Legit. But the I mean the the people writing the show also seem to have really been uh, interested in her performance. So I think there probably is something there. I'm sorry that, like, uh, she's disappointed you so much <laughs> up, up until this point. I, I'm glad to hear that the tables have kind of turned. She back. literally I just had... call her a bad actress. No, I just don't no. think she's been given that great of material right. relative to everyone else. Sure. But... I, I've seen episodes of Voyager where she would have been the most interesting character <laughs> in, these, in the story. So <laughs> yeah, My argument has only ever been that, like, there's a certain repetition of format when she sees her brother. She shows up. She's like, how are things proceeding, brother? And then she, like, touches him in some sort of vaguely seductive way. He says something that's not to her life. Liking. she maybe smacks him or or whatever and she's like you have three weeks and then that's that's kind of subs up most God of the damn it dave you could be a writer on the show <laughs> <laughs> you have three weeks um anyway but this episode was like i felt like firing on all cylinders as far as the interactions and if they're going to do character centric ep- uh, you know character driven episodes this is exactly how i want them to be brian um i guess on the downside it's mm-hmm. kind of a structural mess, and it's tonally kind of all over the place. Right. I The housekeeping style. I grew up loving Doctor Who, so I'm fine with the tone veering all over the place from scene to scene. That, that I enjoy that, and I don't really care too much about structure just because... Doctor Who didn't really pay much attention either. This episode kept feeling like a Doctor Who story to me. There was some very, I mean, yeah. d- especially the stuff with the holograms and stuff like that yeah. was very light. And then suddenly they're talking about guns and mouths. Yeah, and they're <laughs> blowing Borgs out into space and yeah. stuff. And, and that know. did feel a little jarring to me with some of the tonal shifts. But I enjoy them going into some yeah. of the more <clears throat> lighthearted, fun, you might even say goofy. Yeah. Or I would, I'm reluctant to use the term campy. Yeah, but I, I like that they show that side of Star Trek. It just in past Star Trek, I didn't feel as much whiplash kind of bouncing back and forth as I do in Picard. However, yeah. I think that if uh, we continue to get more of the show and kind of get used to its approach, that might seem that might diminish the effect of that. We might get more used to it. Yeah. Well, as I said, it didn't actually bother me, but I didn't notice it. That's reasonable. And I can tell, as I said, this is very much a housekeeping episode in that they there's a bunch of exposition we need to get to the audience so that they will be 
prepared to understand our big finale. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of kind of nudging the characters into the correct position for the finale <laughs> that we need to do. A lot of that nudging is more of relationship than, than, uh, than physically moving them. Right. Um, but, but that said, uh, having said all that bad stuff, each scene was utterly brilliant and utterly charming. So I, even, even though they were kind of all over the place and there was no real structure to it, I didn't, and it was really just how can we disguise all this exposition? They did such a good job making the exposition entertaining that I would have easily watched two hours of that and not felt at all burdened or, or bored or wanting them to get on with it. The card has often been at its best when characters are just standing around talking. Yes. Or sitting around well, talking. Well, that is, and a lot of what the next generation well, tended to be it's best. Kind of true, yeah. yeah. And and Patrick Stewart is so good at uh, vocalizing these lines as mm -hmm. as Picard, and yeah. you know I've I've talked before about his ability to choose scenery, but also I've heard many of the actors he's worked with, he makes them better. He makes them better, which. That's a, a pretty common compliment you hear actors give other actors. When you're working with someone really great, it's so easy to bounce that stuff back and forth. Mm -hmm. and talk about that before. And actually, if you watch the DS9 documentary, uh, What We Left Behind recently, um, the late uh, Aaron Eisenberg uh, talked about uh, a scene that he had with Nog and Cisco and how working with Avery Brooks was so incredible and he brought so much energy to the scene. And it was supposed to be like this dramatic moment where they're kind of yelling at each other. And he said he was so excited that when like Avery like delivered his line, he was like, Oh, this is so cool. And he like almost broke character because he was like giddy and wanted to just like smile and be like, this is so fun. This is so good. But no, like, like he, he said that like, it felt like he passed the ball to him and he, he took it and he passed it back, and it was so fun acting with a guy on that high yeah. caliber level. Those yeah. Shakespearean type actors, they kind of have a sense of pacing and control. I think you have to learn it to do soliloquies in particular and can be, make it commanding <clears throat> yeah. throughout. It's a stage thing. Yeah, that that they, I, I have, a, I, I get what he's saying about how like it must be like pretty awesome to play off of that and really feel like even just a two characters talking is really like a constructed scene with its own highs and lows and rhythms and all of that. Yeah, I, I've always felt the next generation, a huge amount of its success, its success was just the cast. The cast, you can give most of those cast members a rubbish script and they will make it fly. They <laughs> yeah. will make it sing. And as much as DS9 is my preferred Star Trek, mm -hmm. but I have to admit, a lot of those actors cannot get a script to fly nearly as well as the TNG ones. The, the TNG is a, probably a better, in my opinion, better acting cast, even if I prefer the stories and actual ser overall final product of DS9. Interesting but, differentiation. But... um. But yes, and so Picard, and they've done a great job with this series, I think, getting actors, some really fun actors. I yeah. I can easily imagine a lesser actress or actor or whatever making Rafi kind of unbearable. I felt like this is the episode where they kind of, uh, many of them kind of came into their own, so yeah. Simult yeah. almost simultaneously as, as yeah. it was in the same episode. Yeah. And uh, I think I said last week that I found all these ac actors extremely watchable to work, yeah. but this was also the episode where... We kind of understand all these characters kind of have a shared uh, conflict with mm -hmm. this Zot Vosh plot that's been yes. going on. It's yeah. impacted all of them. And so this is the episode where they kind of become a united front and it shows all of their motivations have like this shared common goal yes. going into the, the climax of uh, what I imagine is this first uh, season storyline. Right. The, yeah. All they needed to unite was for one of them to steal the ship. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about like the story, just uh, the short answer yep. of what happens in this episode. Uh, we have some shenanigans on the Borg cube, uh, but basically uh, Seven and Eleanor take over the cube while Nerissa and her Romulans leave to go attack the synth home world that we learned about last week. Picard and Soji are on the La Serena, and everyone kind of gets on the same page there as to, um, we now know kind of the, the origin of the Zot Vosh, how they were uh, given this information from an ancient alien race that the coming of advanced synthetic life can uh, trigger what kind of looked like a galactic uh, apocalypse. It was described as being hell, and so that's why they're wanting to wipe out these Maddox synthetics that are on this planet. And 
Picard and the crew eventually decide that they need to go there and warn those people or help them mount a defense or whatever. And we end with them uh, taking off uh, through some cool Borg transwarp shortcuts to mm-hmm. get there and find out that Narek is still in hot pursuit. And uh, so they're going to have to deal with the clandestine Romulan fuckery as well <laughs> next week, and, right. which will be part one of the two-part finale. And uh, I believe we know that they're... Uh, so Narissa is also probably hot on their trail with uh, well, no, lots she's, of other... She's on her way straight there. With uh, a bunch of other... They're, they're probably going to beat her there. And there's also... There were Starfleet guys meant to... Suppose, ships yeah. supposed to arrive at DS-12. Well, this was the short answer, so yeah. we cut all that I stuff I know. Out. I'm just throwing it out because, I mean, there's going to be some ships, I think, that might just have a dust-up. Well, we're going to talk about that when we go into more detail. And I'm then jumping ahead now. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll give some predictions, if, if Dave, if you want to speculate for next week or... Two weeks from now. Can I just but, say, by the way, that Bruce Maddox's synths should have been called Automatics. <laughs> automatics? Yep. I just uh, thought of that, and I just want to throw it out there I so guess people could groan. Technically, you can suggest that, but <laughs> the question you should have asked is, should I suggest that? <laughs> and the answer to that is, no, you should not. If only Jeff Goldblum had been here to stop me. Well... Let's break this down, starting with the very beginning. Uh, it's old hat to say at this point that every episode begins with either a dream set in the past or a flashback to the actual past. Mm-hmm. But we open here with 14 years ago. So I'm thinking this yeah. is shortly before this is uh, shortly before the synth attack on Mars. But we see a group of 10 Romulan women uh, under the leadership of Commodore O, mm-hmm. who we learn in this episode is a half Romulan, half Vulcan. That's something that I suggested before, I think, to explain uh, which one is she. How she can uh, get that mind yeah. meld on. We, we see the ritual of the, the admonition, which uh, I thought it was it was interesting that the, the basically 10 Romulan... Uh, we don't know why they're all women. but no, That's true. Uh, which That's interesting. That makes them a very specific sort of counterpoint to the... Um, Quillette Murrow. Co- Co-op Malat. Yeah. yeah. Which is also all women, except yeah. for Elnor. Yep. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and they also talk about, like, this is the place that our foremothers discovered, the, uh, the grief world, uh, Aya, I think is how, the name of it. Yep, it's A-I-A, is yeah. that how they spell it? Yeah. If I find a weird artifact on a planet that makes me have a scary vision, I don't necessarily uh, build hundreds of thousands of years of conspiracy on it. But that's just me. I don't know. It must have been a good vision. Um, it's apparently very convincing. Yes. And of these, these ten that see it... Uh, eight of them immediately kill themselves in the most violent, gruesome ways. Yeah. And then of the two that live, one of them uh, kind of loses her marbles there on the spot with uh, Ramda. Yeah. find out is Nerissa and Narek's aunt. And then the other one, Nerissa, uh, seems to hold it together, but we know it also becomes a murderous asshole. <laughs> yeah. But so, I guess, I, you know, here's the thing. She said her aunt... Uh, Ramda is the name? Yeah. She said that she was never all there uh, before, uh, and I wasn't quite sure why they bothered to have that. You know, like, clearly this is the kind of thing that could jar you into that. But I wondered, is there some relevance to the fact that she was a little off-kilter before? I didn't pick up on that line, so I didn't catch that. I I mean, it might just have to do with the fact that she is such a fanatical academic. I mean, yeah. that's, uh, uh, oh, who's yeah. all, uh, you know, who's yeah, also Yeah, she was apparent. the authority on Romulan mythology, even though yeah. Romulans don't use the yeah. term mythology. Yeah. Right. So it might just be that uh, you're but, a bookworm or something, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But um, that, uh, but yeah, that sets up our, um, our big truth about the sort of the Zatvash and this planet. Yeah. So basically what happened is, is <laughs> like I, I mentioned in the short answer, they get this vision of, I guess... What they later describe in this episode is when you develop this advanced synthetic life. They, yeah. they, they use the term advanced. So it can't just be like Data or the, the mud androids from the original series mm. or the Corby androids. I think it has to be something that could like, like Soji, which is kind of like an organic artificial mm. being. But at some point you cross yeah. this threshold, so. which is very Mass Effect type uh, story, yeah. uh, which that kind of bothers me a little bit how similar this is to Mass Effect. But some some is it so different from what they call in the real world? What, what do they call it when AI become like in, smarter yes. than people and self perpetuating? Yes, this, or is, this is very different. This is very different from the singularity. How is it different? In the singularity, they never say that. Like, yeah, if we get to this point, something is going to come kill us all and destroy us. Like, I, I think the idea here is like 
the synthetic life isn't the danger. Something else, else. is going yeah, to come. Yeah, that was how, what I took. How I yeah. took it. They, they mentioned uh, kind of like how Vulcans came to Earth. Oh, that's right. Yeah. When we developed, uh, or when we will develop. Well, uh, it's probably right. not going to happen in real life, but in the it's fictional just... timeline, when mankind develops warp technology, I should say humankind instead yeah. of mankind, but I'm tired of correcting myself. You know what I mean? Watch Star Trek First Contact. You go into space at warp, Vulcans show up on your doorstep. Yes. You build advanced synthetic life, and the reboot from Mass Effect 3 or something yeah. similar to them comes to you and murders you. Yes. Not just murders you, but un- unleashes, unleashes hell. Yes. You said Reavers, but you probably meant Reapers. You'll have to correct yourself. From again. Mass Effect Three, yeah, whatever. I don't know. Hey, so one of our, uh, one of our. Uh, I'm so glad I got far enough in Mass Effect One to not have this be a spoiler. Like <laughs> two days before I watched this episode, <laughs> oh. all of that would have been quite spoilery. And sometimes, like, okay. Ma- Mass they, Effect One came out like 13 years. ago. I know. So. I'm not. I wouldn't have blamed but, you, but I'm. I'm ha- happy to say they just unloaded the enough of the backstory about the Reapers so, that I was able to say, oh, this is kind of like that. <laughs> so one of our one of our listeners uh, mentioned in the comments. They wondered if this octanary star system, apparently so <laughs> rare as to be almost an impossibility to naturally form. Yeah. Uh, um, he wondered if he's like if it could come from somebody with an initial uh, that would be a single alphabet letter. That's what my girlfriend thought when we were watching this. When they said like someone moved these eight stars to be together, she was like, "Oh, is, is that does that mean Q is going to show up?" I did not connect those dots. Well, so here's what I here, and I don't think there, it's obvious or anything, but I think it's a possibility. And there, there's two interesting things. First of all, when she was talking to when Ruffy was talking to the hologram, and she's like, "Why would someone do that?" And he kind of jokingly in his way says like uh, to show how great I am they that you know they are and I was like that does sound like the Q we know yes. uh, an egotist um but also I wondered if like there could be something like at the, if when uh since reach this point that they begin a walk towards what could be a pr- approximate godhood and the Q they're like if it happens we are going to come step on them I don't know. That seems kind of small for the Q. Even something as big as that. I mean, maybe. It doesn't seem like they would set in motion events to prevent it. I can't imagine something like really advanced artificial life being a threat to the the Q continuum. Uh, I I, you know I could easily see in Star Trek uh, godlike aliens. uh, uh, On one hand, you're right. On the other hand, the Q have been very worried about the development of humanity. Maybe it was the development of the androids. uh, So if if it one could see how you could make this work, I'm kind of hoping it's not the Q, but. I could see how you could turn it into the queue given the data points we now have. Yeah, I think I would at least be a little disappointed if that turned out to be the story because QX Machina. It, well, it just seems it just seems small. I can see how they could be going that direction. I hope they are not. Just like well, I, you know, but I want some new alien threat mm-hmm. that is our our what are Reapers Reavers what are yeah. you know, um and that's what I would prefer. And I'm also pretty sure that's going to be the plot of season two. I don't think they have enough time in this season one to wrap everything. To wrap that part up. I think that's going to be... Season well, one is save the synths. They, season two is how do we deal with the consequences of keeping the synths yeah. around. They, they did learn pretty early on that they were going to do a second season. We know that they knew yeah. that internally. Yeah. So I would be surprised if there aren't uh, hooks for season two yeah. in, in these, these last sure. few episodes. I, I think anything, I mean, unless it's something that we already know, like the Q, you well, can't, tr- there's not enough room left to trot out what is that dangerous other, I think, at this point. Because so, clearly the Zatvash don't know. Right. They, yeah. they don't know what it is. But I really like what the secret turned out to be. I, I was so glad it wasn't Skynet or Control yeah. or whatever. I was <laughs> yeah. like, which Discovery season two did such a bad job of. Like they don't even state in there why Control it goes homicidal and wants to like wipe out organic life. It's almost like they just kind of took that as like a default. Like, oh yeah, like advanced computers are going to be bad guys in the future, and yeah. just kind of like expected the audience to jump on that same. That's page. why I hated Age of Ultron too, but it's never <laughs> proper justification. I, I feel like, like I even still... with with Ultron, they 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 talk about his motivations much more than anything with Control and Discovery yeah. season two. I feel like I still kind of need to see whatever it is that's going to come step on the synths or in some yeah. way. Fire, you know, make things, you know, become really crazy and dangerous. Yeah, I need to know, like, well, what exactly is this hell that's going to be unleashed? Right. Planets but blowing up. We saw it. Lots I, of planets blowing up. I know, but 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 why? And what's doing it? I don't want to... I like you it. You know who else blew up planets? Control. Yeah. <laughs> 
I like it being a little mysterious because it kind of gives it like a Lovecraftian element, especially with like this like this truth of the universe that is so horrifying that just knowing it will drive you mad. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I it love is that very type Lovecraftian. There, Did um, there is a, uh, I like it. Also, kind of, I immediately started mapping it onto other Star Trek cultures and continuity, like the 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 Roger Corby episode with the old ones. Yeah, what are little girls made what of? What are little girls made of? TOS season one. Something had all the old, all the the builders of the androids were all gone, and all that was left was the androids. Did they cross that line and get swatted? And all that's left of these robots and the Harry Mud robots are the creators of them. Did they get swatted? Is the reason the Borg still rely on organics for all of their processing because they know they'll get swatted? On the other hand, the Romulan uh, mythologist who got assimilated, the, the knowledge of the secret was enough to disable that whole cube, so maybe the Borg do not know about the yeah. secret. What's the uh, well, species number whatever that invo- from Voyager that whooped up on the Borg? Eight, four, four seven, seven, two. two. Yes. <laughs> I guess there was one more point there. The people who swat do the swatting were able to swat a species that rearranges stars. That's how powerful oh, yeah. the swatters are. Yeah, there's the some bad swatters <laughs> contain, Oh, we rearrange stars for fun. Oh my god, we can't yeah. stop these you, guys. That you know what else some, you do? You die. Yeah, that is some <laughs> dangerous motherfuckers. You die in a, in a hellish apocalypse yeah. that will frighten people for yeah. hundreds of thousands of years. And in that flash sequence, do we see Data's face? Yeah. So, we also see a dead fox, which I heard might be from a Nine Inch Nails music video, but... All right. That's weird. So so they hundred, th- hundreds of thousands of years ago predicted data? I don't know if that's exactly what we should draw from that, or if that was just like a visual indicator for the audience. I don't know if that's literally what these people are seeing, but... Because, okay. um, yeah, that was, but, I was like, that looks a lot like yeah. data's face, but I didn't go back and... Uh, I did not go back and rewind and go frame by frame. But uh, let's, let's uh, move on past that, because we spent a lot of time talking about yeah, that opening. Yeah. Um, and talk about what, what you mentioned with, with Ramda on the board cube. And uh, we, we see Nerissa uh, standing over her hospital bed we, uh, and talking to her about how Ramda had like raised her and Eric after their parents died. Mm-hmm. We, we don't know a lot of that, but I feel like uh, Dave, uh, I mean, like your complaint with her being like a two-dimensional character, mm-hmm. I, I don't think she's, she's a deep character now, but she, they, they do flesh her out a little bit here where we... I, I think seeing how uh, she was the only one who had like the resolve to like not lose her shit when she witnessed this this horror show yeah. that all those other people saw and like um, hear how like we see her like actually have like some concern for like a family member and stuff. She says it should have been me that got uh, simulated by yes. the Borg. She and, kind of jokes about it and does jokingly says like uh, resistance is futile, but she clearly cared for her aunt. Yeah, and and it kind of reminds you that like. Oh, yeah, she has, like, a valid concern about these synthetic life forms. And, uh, she, you know, she's not the villain of her story. It's cliche to say, but, like, yeah, I mean, she thinks she's the hero. She thinks well, she's the one saving the galaxy. I, I have to question her choices, though, because she says, oh, we need to stop Starfleet from uh, the Federation from developing since otherwise we get swatted. Okay, cool, great. Where should I do that? I know I'm going to destroy all the ships that will save my own people. Well, that's Couldn't a, she come up with a better that wasn't, place? That wasn't to... her plan. That wasn't her plan. That was uh, O's plan. Well, still, O's but, half Romulan. She should be like, why would I want to destroy all the Romulans? Why don't we have them attack Earth or or the moon or something that won't disable our rescue fleet? But that, <laughs> that's obviously going to be brought up in like these two remaining episodes. Okay, they better have and a good I, answer for that one. Well, yes. I, I think it's just that like she probably like wasn't fully on board this Federation rescue mission or probably thought that, like, preventing the apocalypse took precedent. But I think that will be acknowledged that, like, oh, in the Zat Vash, they, like, we have a saying in Texas of uh, cut off your nose to spite your face. Yeah. And I I think that's exactly what she did there by, uh, uh, t- like, the, this enemy entity, the Starfleet and the Federation. Mm-hmm. We're going we're gonna to really uh, hurt them uh, by by getting rid of all these synths, but it'll it'll make them stop with this. But you could have waited and, six months and then done your synth plan, and you would have rescued billions of Romulans. 
And I think that they was might... Was she worried that they would be like, uh, that the Romulan people would then feel beholden to the synths among other people? And what would be more yeah, th- horrific this than This is going to be brought up. This is going to be discussed. I think this might actually be how we get uh, a possibly sympathetic character like Narek might go turncoat and might betray O and Nerissa and be like, no, like, like because of you, so many of our people died. And I, I can't be a part of this anymore. Yeah, I, I, but I do need to know what her logic was. She's half Vulcan. There should have been some logic <laughs> <laughs> about wh- why she decided to choose that particular terrorist act the, to cut her own nose off. I bet we might hear it. You know, one of the things here that I think might come into play, I'll be disappointed if it doesn't, is the fact that they obtained this board cube around the same time as they... Uh, recoded the synths to do the Mars massacre. Yeah. So I think they might have actually had technology from the the Borg cube that helped them hack all the synths or whatever yeah, like whatever they needed to do. That's and that's it. that's kind of why all this stuff happened at the same time. I can't accept it. <laughs> but also on this uh, this Borg cube, we have seven of nine arrives uh, in response to Elnor's and uh, gets hugged. Calling. I love the hug. But but we have oh. to say she comes in guns blazing first, and she gets to be a badass. Yeah. yeah. Well, we we have like Elnor like fighting Romulans there. I guess like yeah. they're trying to take him alive so that's why they don't just like shoot him with their disruptors. I did but, like how badass he was while blinded. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then <laughs> but then like Seven comes on board so we have like the, the two big badasses yeah. uh, and, and his reaction of like hugging her. Yeah. Because it, it reminds you of his youth and his innocence. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I loved when uh, she was questioning whether she should take over and reactivate the Borg on on the thing as a new queen. And he's like, and she's like, I can't imagine taking away their free will. And he's like, you can release them when we're done, when we win. And I was like, it was such a childlike answer. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. Like, I actually really liked his character there. And I like how in a weird way he has, of all things, Picard as sort of a surrogate father and Seven or a, the now Borg queen yeah. as a surrogate mother. It's yeah. weird, but cool. Well, and also you see him... I want to. I want to be a good. What's the the nuns? The quill. The, the Kowat Malat. Kowat Malat. I want to be a good one of those. And then, oh, this is a lost cause. This is really a lost cause. The lost this is the most lost. <laughs> I, I, what did I get? My, oh my god, I got rescued. Thank you, Gail Hug. You know, you, he's clearly gotten in over his head and and gone a little bit. For, this lost cause thing turned out to be a little rougher than he thought it was going right. to be. Oh, and I also like, and I like that. I like that we get like explanation for that that Finris Ranger calling card yes. because she she shows up and she wants to know where's Hugh. So apparently she had met Hugh at some point and that was probably something that she had given him. Like if you ever need me, if, if things get too crazy out here, I don't trust these Romulans, you can call yeah. and I'll show up to help you. Because that was that was Hugh's office apparently yeah. where that, that Finris Ranger card was. That was the same spot where I think uh, when the first time we see Hugh in this show... When he's watching the holographic video of Soji working with an XB, mm-hmm. I think I think that's where he was standing, mm. uh, that little guardrail station, which uh, doesn't really seem like an office to me. But I guess like if you're a Borg, if you're a former Borg, <laughs> you don't need a lot of room. Yeah, like that's you're, that's kind of the work environment you're used to on the cube. <laughs> but yeah, the the queen cell firing up and activating uh, right when Nerissa is going on a XB murder spree. Yeah. I actually uh, thought that she had straight up vented all of them into space, and I was like, well, wait, what is Seven even going to do? So this is one of the problems I have with the episode. I think it's so cool and empowering to see like Seven of Nine kind of embrace her her Borg side. She's always struggled with it, mm-hmm. but she's like, no, like this is this is kind of our only way out here, and she goes like full-on Borg badass. And then they uh, hamstring her. But then, like immediately after that, they they uh, blow all the drones out into space. Yeah, blown out, not sucked out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as yes. Data would let us know. <laughs> yes. Um. Uh. That that was like weird to me because I was like, oh, so those are I guess all the drones that hadn't been like activated and like yeah. deborgified. Right. So the, the people that 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 come to her service later, I guess, were some of the. XBs that were already like walking around on the queue, but the, uh, Nerissa thought that she killed all of them, so that kind of didn't make sense to me. It's not quite super and clear. We also know that we've seen drones operate in the vacuum of space I before. Just, uh, yeah, I don't so, think those drones. Why are? The, do we have any evidence the drones that got blown into space are dead? No. I think what, what just I would, maybe that she kind of acted like they were, yeah. or at least that they were neutered. Her, her, her reaction was pretty strong. Um, so what I would like to see 
happen is that after the Romulans leave the cube, uh, they were the 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 Borg are able to get beamed back on board. Well, they did act like, oh, we need to go destroy all the Borg in in floating in space, but then they changed their mind and just ran away. Right. Not were being... they worried that the Borg cube was about to start shooting at them? Um, she had taken well, it over. Well, originally, right? Narissa thought she had won and could, had control of the Borg cube, and she calls them up and says, "All right, let's deal with all the destroy all those drones uh, floating in space," and then. A bunch of XBs attack her, and she gets beamed back to a Romulan yeah. ship, and she clearly, all right, we don't know what that cube, that cube could open fire at any moment. Right. Clearly, I'm not in charge. Let's just leave. Yeah. Which, so, that, was, that was how I took it. That <laughs> was pretty cool, how those XBs sneak up on her, and they, they, they take out one of her underlings, and then she finds herself surrounded, and they're kind of like zombies, just sure. like... Like dog piling her, like they're about to rip her limbs I off. I kind of wanted them to win, and, rip her limbs <laughs> off. I was for, like ready for a split for that. second, yeah, for a split second, I thought she was going to bite the dust. And I do want to see this character pay for murdering Hugh, but I also kind of enjoy her uh, somewhat cartoony but still fun <laughs> villainy. Yeah, I kind of like having that character on the show, so I, I wasn't quite ready to see her go. So uh, I, I had mixed feelings about seeing her get beamed out there. Well, she may find herself head to head with Soji before all things. I want to see Elnor be the one to take her out, but I, something tells me it's not going to be him. It'll be someone else. But uh, yeah, the seven um, did what I what I predicted was that she might uh, become like a, a Borg queen, even though they never use that term. But she is using the the queen in cells. So I think we're meant to make yeah. that comparison for sure. However, I didn't think she would like relinquish it and uh kind of go back to normal the 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 line that she's given when she's speaking i guess from the the voice of this micro collective which i thought was a cool idea is, just controlling a ship yeah. a ship's worth of which board. we've seen that before in first contact that sphere goes back in time is yeah. is disconnected from the collective. Sure. but i wanted too. i wanted it to be borg so. that are like separated from the other borgs it, like not just in their network but also in like their um, their like motivation, their philosophy, and their, yeah, their their like uh, uh, approach to uh, like interacting with other people. Like I don't I don't want there to be Borg that like you're trying to assimilate everyone. I want there to be like a cube of Borg that are still very Borgish and maintain a lot of their Borg identity, but are our friends and not our enemies. That would be interesting. I it's think kind of a, we're, could be where we're headed. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a different season than this season. And, but, and but having, yes, having I, would, seven, I would watch that. Having Seven be in charge of that, I think, would be really cool. And uh, I was almost like a little disappointed when she like disconnects from the cube. But I think that means that she's going to be used in, in uh, part of like what will probably be a big action-y set piece in these remaining two episodes. And the way that the that voice that she speaks with when she says... Um, uh, something like like Annika still has work to do. Yes. Um, it kind of makes me think maybe she made a, an arrangement with like that micro collective. Like I'll come back when all this is done, and uh, I, I would like to see something like that happen. I thought about that, but that's I, interesting. I'm certainly like, glad to see her still asserting her pre Borg identity. Uh, that it, she had not. They did not go immediately in the direction of she has been subsumed by the Borg yeah. uh, again. Oh, There's... Part of me that wants to see more of her in season two, but there's also part of me that feels like that's going to take away from the opportunities to see what all the other characters yeah. have been up to. Let's so, see some Deep Space Nine in season two. Yeah, yeah, you know. But... Re- rebuild the DS9 sets and go to that station and show me what it's like all these years later. <laughs> that's going to be an expensive proposition. You just want to, you just want a new DS9 show out of this. Ultimately, yeah. I would I would love to have like a, a season eight of DS9. Um, they uh, they seem to be making a few shows. Anything else about like the board cube stuff? I've seen some people complaining about the the animation of like the the cube regeneration. Oh yeah, you see those little green robot things like repairing the the cube. Yeah, I've seen some people complain about the look of those, but I I like that it's different from what we've seen before. Yeah, because the the Borg their whole thing is like they adapt and they try to per- perfect themselves, and so sure. like. Uh, I, I think I think the Borg of Picard should be a little different from the Borg of Voyager, much like the Borg of Voyager were a little different from the Borg of TNG. Yeah, the the sort of onward march of technology and special effects in a meta sense uh, kind of works in the favor of the Borg. Yeah. They're always getting a new slight <laughs> overhaul. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, thank God we didn't get the little uh, droney robots from uh, Discovery. <laughs> yeah, they didn't assimilate. <laughs> they a, didn't uh, just make them green. <laughs> they didn't assimilate a dot seven. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else have we got? Are we going to the La Serena? Let's go to the La Serena. The last episode ended 
we with Soji and Picard, you know, beaming up to the La Serena. So here we see their arrival, and uh, essentially Picard, uh, now that he knows from Soji that there's a the synth world where Maddox had set up shop, where there are more synths, and the Zotvash are on their way there to likely exterminate them. He says, uh, you know, we need to help those people, but he understands that he can't do that alone. I love that the show gave Picard the sense here to be like, okay, this is the point where, like, you phone it in. Like, you call Starfleet, you let them know, and um, so we have uh, Picard basically says, okay, let's go to the nearest starbase, Deep Space 12, and I'm going to call... The Starfleet C&C, Admiral Clancy. His old friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I like seeing the conversation between the two of them. She's like the, the distillation of anybody who ever found Picard Pompous. <laughs> She's like that. that they're, she gives voice to their uh, like the annoyance. Shut the fuck up, Picard, or something. Yeah. Uh, oh, that was amazing. <laughs> I started reading the, uh, the Picard novel yeah. by, is it uh, Una McCormick who wrote it? Sounds... I, I think so. Um, but... Is I think, her name really Una? Yes. No. <laughs> That's why they named number one that in the books and then later in Discovery was because of this author who... Oh, I thought it dated back way before then. No. Uh, it only goes back a few years. Huh? Uh, as, as far as I know. But the way that she's written in the book... And I, I've when I say I started reading it, I, I got like the free sample online, and I've only read okay. half of the first chapter. All right, but just just in those like uh, you're the you're the expert pages, at the moment. Um, she's she's a captain at the time because this is set, uh, you know, that 14 year earlier time frame, mm-hmm. and she kind of like uh, butts heads with with Picard then. So the it's, it's, the implications that they like, kind of have this history. However, I like that when he when Picard is going on, like, oh, you see that I was right. You thought I was just like a senile old man, but now look at all this proof I've given. And she tells him, shut the fuck up. I believe you. Yeah, you were right. Like, she she kind of just tells him, um, yes, you were right. And when I send ships. Yeah. Do not fucking gloat at me about it. <laughs> but I like that, like, she kind of, like, doesn't have a problem, like, admitting that to him. Yeah. And just be like... That was nice. And it, I actually really like this character. I mm-hmm. know, like, a lot of people are annoyed at her because they think she's mean to Picard. Oh, I think she's great. <laughs> well, when we got her introduction way back in episode two... Yeah. yeah. Um, of, of the show, uh, when Picard comes to her with all this crazy stuff that he's talking about, this guy who was, like, just on the news going off of his rocker talking about how Starfleet sucks <laughs> now, and uh, she tells him all this stuff, she doesn't just ignore it. She contacts Commodore O, who she believes at the time is a uh, honest actor, mm-hmm. yeah. and says like, hey... In the off chance of something. Yeah, do you think it. we should look into this? He, he he sounded crazy, but there might be something there. Mm-hmm. So I really like this character. Yeah, I would be happy to see her have a continuing role in the series. Uh, I did notice it. I believe the... I, I've seen the, the... But she has to drop the F-bomb every time she <laughs> talks, to, talks to Picard. I like both those line deliveries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I they like were it. great. They're the best F-bombs in Star Trek. So. That scene had the last scene that I remember uh, being specifically from the preview, the trailer yeah. for this, where Picard claps his hand, he gets a little hand slap thing. He's like, hot dog! Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which is maybe not the most Picard thing, but it's... He got what he no. really, really, really needed, and I... I uh, uh, I had no context for that. Uh, I actually thought, I think from the trailers way back when, I was like, oh, that must be when he, like, gets the ship up and running or something like that. Well, I, I yeah, the, I was reminded of seeing that in the trailers also. And you took note of that uh, long ago when we were discussing that before the show had premiered, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, when I saw that, I, I, I liked it because even though it does seem a little out of character for Picard, I think this plays into their, their approach of, of treating him as an elderly individual. Yeah. And I think when people are... Uh, at this age, a lot of times, like, they, they do start to have some of these more childish behaviors. Some of those kind of, like, knee-jerk emotional reactions. Shakespeare's and, uh, famous Seven Ages of Man speech, the All the World's a Stage, uh, refers to uh, the final age of man as the second childhood. Yes. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, and yep. it's... Uh, applicable here maybe patrick stewart being the shakespearean maybe that was an acting choice that he made thinking of that or interesting uh maybe not that's but regardless i still like that choice now we we have so kind of like the lost arena's mission at this point is to go to ds12 clancy tells him to stay there i'm sending a squadron of ships and i hope we see the squadron Uh, i really want to see like some modern starfleet ships but as soon as she says that you're like 
okay, the audience knows Picard ain't gonna stay at DS12. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, let's let's talk about what happens on on the Lost Arena after that. Just with with each character. Uh, um, let's uh, start with with Raffi, and then we'll, like we'll work our way around the ship. Um, well, the the first we see Raffi in this episode is when Picard and Soji beam up, and uh, Raffi does not trust Soji initially. Yeah, well, after the Agnes Gerardi uh, incident, uh, yeah. I can understand that. It led to one person dying on their ship. Uh, a part of being the conspiracy theorist is that she's also uh, a little paranoid. Mm. Uh, but we did see her object to to Agnes coming on, someone who she hadn't like vetted. She doesn't know anything about this person. She doesn't trust her. And those instincts turned out to be uh, somewhat prophetic. Yeah. So we get the same thing here. I like I like the line of... Um, uh, you know, you one pissant little neuron. That's why you trust her, because like she was grown out of the neuron of a guy you knew. Yeah, <laughs> I will say, I think in the case of Angus, that was a, a kind of a bit of a one in a million thing. You said that Angus. Is, her name uh, is Agnes. 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 Sorry, <laughs> uh, Agnes. That she's just paranoid of everyone. So of course, eventually, she's going to be right about it. <laughs> I, I, that's definitely how I read that. Yeah, but, although <laughs> I, I did. Um, what, I think what I loved about th- this scene and many of the scenes that followed is that she kind of became, I think she really got to lean into one of the funner aspects of the character, not her grieving side and, or the, you know, that unrequited love with for her child, but her as Fox Mulder from the 90s X-Files, uh, <laughs> cracking the case and in talking to the holograms, I believe doing the equivalent of talking to the lone gunman. Yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> when she first started talking to the holograms, the first one she talks to is the navigational hologram who's yeah. flying the ship. It was a very sweet scene. Yeah. And, uh, well, that, that first scene, I didn't like. It's one of the things in this episode that I complain about because Ravi kind of comes off as dumb when she mistakes that hologram for Rios. Right. Uh, it, it took her a little... Like, I kind of knew right off the bat that that was not Rios. Well, we were seeing his face. She wasn't. She yeah. was sitting behind, so well, she was only seeing the back we never, of his head. We never see Rios sit in one of those front two chairs. and Everyone so. rolls a one on their die every sure. now and then. She sure. smokes a lot of uh, death sticks. She's been clean <laughs> lately. Uh, yeah, I was joking. <laughs> what do they call them? What's their... Uh, oh, the snake... Uh, s- snake snake bite. weed or whatever. S- yeah, snake yeah. bite. Yeah. yeah, snake bite. Uh, but she also did mention that apparently she has like uh, asked the uh, the medical hologram, I think, to well, the hospitality hologram. hospitality <laughs> hologram to for, forbid her from uh, drinking alcohol and to forbid her from doing an override on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so apparently she might have bro- broken some rules. I'm just saying she may have had some cloudy days on the La Serena. Yeah. Well, let's talk about like we... these different holograms. We kind of get names for all of them. The E N H, the emergency navigational hologram, which is the one in the Irish accent. Yep. And his name is Enoch. The uh, engineering hologram, which of course is the Scottish one, the E-E-H. Is Almost too meta for me, but yeah. still kind of fun because all of those scenes were kind of fun. Mm-hmm. That I, one, that one's name is Ian. I appreciated somebody on the internet pointing out that it's yet another engineer with a fake Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that was like, that's amazing. It's so much better that way. <laughs> um... <laughs> We have the the hospitality hologram who has an American accent. Yep. Please state um, the nature of the hospitality the, emergency. The, the only name we get for him is Mister Hospitality. Uh, okay. It's uh, and then the uh, Amel is the emergency medical hologram who has an English accent. Mm-hmm. And then Emmett, the E T H, the emergency tactical hologram, uh, has a uh, well, he only he speaks exclusively in Spanish. Yeah. He always always seems like but with a Scottish accent. <laughs> he always seems like he's wrecked. Like he's just coming up from a bender. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Um, where did those names come from? Or do we have any sense? Like, is that, were those essentially his nicknames for um, presumably? Yeah, and they're all kind of derived from like the spelling of like, like uh, Enoch. Uh, it has like E and then N and it's kind of like emergency navigational. I gotcha. Like, uh, they're, they're all kind of like cheats, but kind of are like derived from what they're... Okay. What their spelling is. Um, but they, they all have like a, a little bit different personality. And so the idea we get here is that that uh, Rios, uh, who is hiding out in his cabin. Drinking. Uh, yeah, he was freaked out by seeing Soji on his ship. Uh, With a look of recognition. And, and Raffi is, is talking to all his holograms like, oh, you each have a part of his personality. You seem to each like know a little bit. And she's trying to piece the stuff together. Like she gets the name. Uh, oh, yeah, there is someone named uh, Jonna, who 
looked like Soji, mm -hmm. and it was something on the uh, his his ship he was on, the Starfleet ship, the uh, Ibn Majed, and then the uh, tactical hologram Emmett. He's like, oh yeah, like the old captain. He shot himself, and she kind of gets all these different details, and then goes to talk to uh, Rios himself. Here we kind of see a, a flip of what we saw previously when when uh, Rios had to like carry a drunk Rappy to her room and and kind of like he had to uh, be her caretaker for yeah comfort her and here we get to see her return the favor and uh, help Rios who yeah he was so freaked out by the sight of of, of Soji uh, like you mentioned he seemed to have recognized her so he locks himself in his cabin uh, surrounded by little mermaid statues from different like earth culture depictions of mermaids like yep. the La Serena's Spanish nice for little mermaid. touch and none of which had gotten knocked off the shelf and broke when they were attacked <laughs> by that Romulan pirate oh you know well, inertial, may have been, but he's a inertial dampeners are, are good at uh, like locking and, that shit down well, wait, wait, so they have the good inertial dampeners in the quarters but the bridge has the shitty inertial dampeners yeah <laughs> well do, do, I, I'm sure he uh, picked them up uh, because he's Starfleet. Oh, uh, so yeah, but, but they're not broken. Some of them look order. pretty fragile. Maybe um, he had to re uh, synth them. Yeah, that, okay, fair enough. <laughs> but he, he's yeah. sipping the, the Arguadente and uh, getting uh, almost blackout drunk on the floor of his bedroom, going through like a, what looked like an old Starfleet footlocker. And it contained a cigar box, which ties into like his whole like cigar thing. Yep. Uh, it was full of all his Starfleet. Um, mementos from from his his past career you know i was looking at uh i think um memory alpha's uh, summary of the episode and i think they suggested that it might have been uh, what was his like some mementos from his captain's uh, like cabin after the after his captain's death like uh, i don't know quite where you would necessarily derive that it seemed like it was his but yeah uh, i don't know where they got that other than the fact that there's like a picture of the two of them together yeah but uh, like, i love that he uh, said he thought of him as a father santiago cabrera actually like looks like a, a decade younger in this picture like they didn't oh, just yeah. use like a recent picture of him they they either like de-aged him or photoshopped like an old picture of, yep. of the actor um, but yeah, but we see him with his old captain, Captain Alonzo Vandermeer. Yep. And um, I like that they also had his rank pips. And it was like the exact number of rank pips you would have if you had like every rank and got like a new set. Like you had like one gold oh. for Ensign, then you had one gold and one black for Lieutenant Junior Grade. Oh. All your way up to Commander. I actually like counted them out. And I'm it... surprised at that <laughs> level of detail. Not from you, from them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah good, good job, prop department. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, Raffi, Raffi does come in here to comfort Rios and, and to draw that story out, uh, the, the yes. story of what really happened, yeah. which we learned, uh, that they were on a mission, the Ibn Majed, they were in the, the, the Vought sector where we know the synth world is, mm -hmm. and they made first contact with what we, we can now determine was Maddox's synths. Mm -hmm. Um, but Do they, they have any notion as to why they would just be roaming about? Well, they were, like, uh, in their neighborhood. Yeah, I guess so. Like, they could have been on some sort of, you know, mission of any sort, I guess, from the planet. Yeah, and maybe, like, maybe at this time Maddox or whoever was in charge there is like, yeah, okay, like, at this point, it's okay to, like, reveal ourselves. They just ran um, right into his automatics. <laughs> it, well, what what is weird to me here is that we find out there is a, uh ambassador, uh, and his name was a Beautiful Flower. Yeah, a little bit odd. That's yeah. very... So, I don't know, Eastern uh, or... They're all into this flower, hybrid, orchid thing. Yeah, well, that's a dumb yeah. name. It just sounds dumb. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, what's-his-name, uh, Tsung clearly had his notions about naming androids, uh, and it may well be that Maddox had his own. Um, yeah, but I kind of like B4 or Data or Lore all more than uh, Beautiful Flower. <laughs> but uh, luckily for you, Fathery, uh, Captain Vandermeer killed him. Yes. The <laughs> beautiful Flower was killed, and also his uh, the Ambassador's assistant, mm. who was the, the mentioned uh, Janna, mm. who apparently is identical to Soji and Dodge. Yeah, so, so like there's, that same there's more model. than just two. I bet there's like hundreds of those that model. Yeah. Um, now, th this was because he got a directive from Starfleet. Mm. We can now piece together this This would have had to have come from Commodore O. Right. And 
Can we assume that O must have done the mind meld thing with the captain? That is what I was thinking. Because uh, the, the shooting yourself in the head just doesn't make sense otherwise. And I like that the, if that is the case, that they haven't revealed it here because this is what gives Rios his guilt. Yeah. Because he gave this guy a hard time. He's like, what the hell? You murdered these two people in cold blood? How could you do that? I don't care if you were ordered by Starfleet. I looked up to you. You were my captain. I, I can't believe you would do this. And then the captain kills himself. Yeah. Rios thinks he guilted him into it but i think it might have been uh this guy struggling with like he might have been uh, had, yeah had like one of those mind melds from yeah. O and received like the instruction similar to what what happened to agnes gerard he specifically which, mentioned her psychic block to this yeah. which raises an interesting question how many starfleet captains are running around with o's baggage in their heads oh what if the squadron that's coming to help oh them i hadn't even actually, thought about that oh yeah. oh oh shit yeah <laughs> oh man like some of them oh like, indeed some could, be, some could be legit some could be under her command because they were sent not sent by her though yeah, yeah, but, but she, she might have a way of triggering that that psychic thing that she's done yeah, to all these captains. That would be messed up if they yeah, showed she, up she like she the cavalry agents, and then they just start shooting the good guys. They would never do a setup in this show where it looks like the heroes have a big army and then wipe the whole army out at the. Uh, 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 <laughs> they would never pull the rug out of us like that. <laughs> Nothing will get vented into space. Yes, yes. Uh, wow, I real I want that to happen now. Yeah. Uh, and he also specifically mentioned, just kind of on a thematic level that kind of ties into how we think of maybe Starfleet, that he was, re- Rios mentions he was really broken up that the, his captain died thinking that uh, that Starfleet was had become this distorted version of itself, that it would ask him to do this, and not knowing that it came from O, who was essentially a decades plus, you know, plant, you know, secret agent, distorting things, and, and very specifically... Uh, distorting them. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's part of his guilt, but also part of the... Th- I think some of the themes we're getting about Starfleet. Yeah, yeah. and, and for, for Raffi, this is kind of the final piece she needs for her conspiracy theory she's been working on for years. Yeah. yeah. And she kind of is now able to, to lay it all out for both the other characters as well as the audience. She was a little excited um, a few times in the episode <laughs> at it. I, 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 I kind of liked that even though it was serious events, she was a little giddy about it. Yeah, even with like the dire circumstances. Yeah. Uh, now, let's talk about uh, Agnes. There's there's a cool Picard scene in here between him and, and several of the, these characters. But like uh, the one with, with Agnes, I think, is the first one that occurs where uh, he he comes this to her a- and. and yeah, when when she's like waking up from her coma, right. she was in before their what is it breakfast or dinner conversation. Yeah, yeah and, and he's asking her, you know, like like you know, how could you do this? Um, you you even killed the man that that you loved because we kind of we kind of know everything now. Like the, that emergency medical hologram finally tells people. My hunch that, is Raffi undid whatever Gerardi did uh, to the. She did some ship. um some digital forensics. Yeah, in my head canon, she hit it and then. Uh, Rafi was able to uncover it when she knew what to... When everyone knows the truth now about about Agnes and uh, Maddox, and Agnes starts talking about, yeah, the psychic block she was given, how this is hard for her to talk about, but she feels like she wants to kill herself, and she's she's terrified of of what she was shown. Did she not know she was a... A Manchurian candidate until Maddox showed up on the ship, and then suddenly all that stuff trigger. Rem- she remembers. I all suppose that. that's possible. Because I... she seems really light and happy, and not all that in the early episodes. Yeah, and then suddenly Maddox, and she's like, "Must kill Maddox," you know. So <laughs> I don't know if it was quite like that. Well, but... <laughs> I appreciate a little Dalek style. Yeah. I was, I was worried about you know from early on. I was worried about this revelation not being satisfactory mm-hmm. but uh, you know because of and, and uh, dave i think you were the first to suggest that like a mind meld might be a good explanation mm-hmm. like not only was it just like uh showing uh Girardi why this is important that that the synthetics must be defeated but also uh there's probably some uh beyond manipulation there's probably like some uh, level of, of control, like mind control type right. stuff going on. You like, you can implant uh, orders that are hard to disobey. Right. Well, but we also know that she did... Oh, sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say, we are, she, she's, she was kind of a true believer in the sense of, like, she did... The, the, the images she saw were the, the terrible sort of Zatvash fears of what will happen, the some version of the... Uh, what do they call the thing they put their hand on? The... Mm-hmm. the uh, ab- 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 abnomition. Abnomition. A- abnomition, yeah. yeah. So that, that means that, like, like, um, the, what does abnomition mean? Doesn't it mean like a, uh, well, like you get a, admonished. Like a, 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 
Yeah, yeah, like a, st- a strict teacher might smack somebody with the somebody's yeah, it's knuckles. Like, it's like a warning, warning. and you, yeah, it's like a warning. Don't mess with it again. Um, okay, so I guess I that's a yeah. I guess the big school teachers in this are the unknown yeah. entity. Yeah, uh, my my question is: Is the the overpowering imperative that this is the absolute truth of what will happen if these synths android things reach a certain level? Did that come from O manipulating Jurati? Or did that come from, did she just pass it on from the planet, from the, the, the planet of grief? It, it, did the planet put it in her head and she's just putting copies into other people's heads? I it, bet it's something like that, yeah. but uh, I, don't know, I, mean, I don't know if they'll dive into the specifics the, 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 on that or not. Yeah, I always figured it was like, there was like, O had like her full agency here. But th- that could be that, yeah, the, the abnomition itself is, is actually kind of a... Uh, uh, hostile meme that, yeah. that is yeah. you know going from brain to brain you know and and it, yeah well, i'm, I'm so curious these, these super they... deadly aliens are, are intergalactic meme lords uh well we don't know are they, these might well, be the well, survivors no, yeah. of the or, super deadly aliens right or, yeah there there's no. there's multiple uh ancient alien uh yeah. intelligence at at work here right um but we also get agnes meeting soji seeing one of Maddox's creations, uh, literally in the flesh. Uh, Alison Pill is the actress, right? That, that's who plays uh, Agnes Durant. Yeah, uh, I thought she got to really do some great work in this episode. In almost yeah. every one of her scenes, uh, she was yeah. superb. Uh, and a huge ability to emote and like to cry, just to like to draw that emotion out, uh, including like with sort of like like a sort of a. I mean, she seemed like she was torn when she actually met Soji, who to her is the destroyer. Uh, she, or at least to, to some degree, uh, but she was uh, so amazed by her and so charmed by her that there were also sort of almost like tears of joy yeah. or or almost envy that she had not been able to be a part of that her world. Well, she's like the big cyberneticist nerd. That's like yeah. her like passionate field that she works in. Yeah. And so, and, and after like having to deal with like this band for fourteen years. To actually be able to, to meet, like, this... The this, culmination. Yes. Like, what what they had actually been striving for. And, you know, the way that, she, like, she compliments her, uh, which was kind of weird. It's almost, like, objectifying her. Yeah. Make, making her feel like a fake person. Yeah. But saying, like, oh, you have these these beauty marks. And, oh, what's that? You have you say you have a mole on your chest and a crooked pinky toe. You're, you're such a, a perfect work of art. And, and that's when that's when Soji reacts to her, like, uh, but am I a real person, though? Do you think I'm a real person? <laughs> Um, it felt very real, even if it wasn't necessarily politically correct. And uh, well, I, I, yeah, I don't yeah. have a, I don't have a problem with it. I yeah. just I just think it, it's, we know that Jurati is going through out. some stuff. Yeah, but also like Soji's response to her was like, uh, I'm, "I'm sure you were sent to kill me too." And just so you know, I will never let that happen because I'm the, the the show has established how big of a badass I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then I don't Soji- know. That felt like the sort of thing that means, oh no, she is gonna. At least try. There's well, going to be a close moment. Do we? For, are we willing to forgive Agnes at this point? Yes. Um. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, she she was a she was mind controlled for to, to put it as simply right. as possible. Yeah, it's the same as uh, you know giving a check off the uh, the ear slug in Rathacon. Okay. I, I I feel like he's. He's he's not responsible for his actions. Yeah, um, and we've seen her shed tears. Yeah. Very very convenient, yeah. but uh... <laughs> next question: Do we still do we trust her now, or is she going to rel- do we think she might relapse? I kind of feel like the intent of the show here, with like the yes, I'll never try to kill you now. I think they're trying to t- tell us that yeah, you know, she's she's overcome the psychic block, and it's okay to trust her now. But like like you you suggest, it could be. Uh, they're they're setting us up to to pull one on us and and trick us and have her actually do a a double betrayal. Well, the Chekhov did exactly that in Wrath of Khan. <laughs> they thought they had him back, and then he turned again. Yes. Um, I, I kind of hope that they don't, but but I can see how it could be a good dramatic scene, and you could potentially pull it off. So yeah, I'm okay I'm with being done with, with it, they, though. Yeah, if, if, if that, that's what, I guess that's where I would land. If, if they want to drop it here, I'm okay with dropping it here. Yeah. I think she's kind of done her emotional penance. Oh yeah, and, and she does like agree to like turn herself into the authorities at, at Deep Space Twelve. So yeah. I, I think it's possible the show is just sincerely wanting us yeah. to trust her again. It, it does seem like how would she possibly help O if she goes off and gets locked up on DS Twelve? Right. You know. Yeah. That 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 uh, she would have to pull her stunt before then. So. 
Now, let's talk about Soji. She's still struggling with these recent revelations that, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, an artificial being, your boyfriend tried to kill you, all of this stuff. I think Picard is incredibly sympathetic here. When they have that conversation eating breakfast when she's, she's eating eggs and she's like, I don't even know if I like eggs or if I'm programmed to like yeah. eggs or, or what's going One on One of my here. favorite scenes in the whole series oh, that so was, far. That was brilliant. I love that scene. The, the scene where they start deconstructing what data, how, who data was and what data would have thought of Picard. And what Picard, and then they segue to like how Picard would have liked data to have thought of it. Yes. But yes. before we even get into that, yeah. I was already liking this before yeah. they even brought up all that cool stuff with data. Yeah. Just because the way that Picard talks to this person dealing with this incredible trauma here, mm-hmm. I think it was a great representation of how you should talk to people who have been through traumatic things that you haven't where he he like acknowledges he's like you're right i don't know your experience i don't know that you know all i can do is like imagine and he's he's just very sympathetic and he's not judgmental at all and uh that's how you should be in situations like that yeah uh throughout the series i've been i've been impressed with patrick stewart who's such a great orator his ability to portray himself listening. Uh, even, you know, obviously Picard has to, is the yeah. lead character and he's going to have some thoughts on it. And Picard was always a good listener. Like, the, but, that's, that's true. Patrick Stewart says that was the one thing he learned about playing that character is he mm-hmm. learned to, you know, listen to people around you and it made him a better sure. listener. IRL. You know, um, they showed in the previously on uh, this episode, they showed the scene where uh, Riker and Troy's kid, Kestra, was talking to uh, Soji and saying that, you know, that she didn't have any parents, but if she wanted him, Picard could be that person for her. And I really do wonder if Picard, who is throughout, even back as far as Next Generation and on to uh, Generations when his nephew died and he seemed to have lost anything that approached a son for him, if he will ultimately gain Soji as something like a child or a grandchild. Yeah, and... I, th- I think the, the way that they talk about Data here with Picard remembering Data, how, you know, him being like the mentor and the leader and the captain on, on TNG, he did kind of have kind of a paternal role. Right. And with Data being the most childlike, other than the actual child, Wesley Crusher, <laughs> right. with, with Data being the second most childlike, uh, they, they do kind of at times feel like they have like a, a, a parent-child relationship between Picard and Data. And the way that he describes them as... Um, you know, what, are, what are some of the adjectives Picard uses here? He, he said, said he was brave. I remember that he was uh, inquisitive, maybe. Yes. Yeah, uh, brave, curious, very gentle, a child's wisdom, no bias, uh, made us all laugh, except for when he was trying to make us all laugh. <laughs> yeah, that's legit. And, and then Picard acknowledges that... Um, this, is my, this is maybe my favorite part. Yeah, when, when he says Data's ability to process and express emotion was limited, and Picard says, I guess mine was too. Yeah, mm-hmm. what, a, what a beautiful, insightful thing for an older person to reflect on their younger yes, self. Uh, I love that. Yeah, yeah I thought that was, was some of the best scripting in the whole thing. Yeah. It, was, it was cathartic to hear that, especially if you go back to season one, Grumpy Picard. Yeah. yeah. And then all the way like from that to, you know, from the, like, the, the mean hard ass in season one, to the guy who sat down at the poker table in First Contact. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, in uh, All, All Good, Good Things. things. Um, to the guy who who lost his family and ter- had a midlife crisis and turned into an action hero. <laughs> and starting with the First Contact and, and onward, like, driving a dune buggy around. And then losing Data. And uh, now to where he is at the state where the, the character is, like, in his 90s. Mm-hmm. And to have that reflection back, I thought was... Uh, incredibly powerful, and I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. And then also how he told Soji how I would like Data to remember me. You know, if I had been the one to die, if he had survived, and, and that also sounded very like paternal. Like I want him to remember me as a guy who like you know was always rooting for him, a guy who helped him when he needed help, a guy who got out of the way when he didn't need help. And uh, he ultimately ultimately expresses that that uh, he he would have liked to have known that that Data loved him. And then when Soji says Data did love you, because oh, she has those memories, she she felt that whatever like that weird type of android emotion chip level of processing that. It was uh, just a perfect beat to end that scene on. It it, it was it was deep, and yeah. there was nothing more to be said. Uh, it, was, it was that yeah. was that was a perfectly staged sequence. Yes. 
I love a good bromance, <laughs> even if one of them's de- died 14 <laughs> years ago. So. Yeah. Um, no, I, I love stories of, about friendship. Yeah. Um, and Star Trek's done a lot of good ones, from uh, Kirk and Spock to uh, Bashir and O'Brien. And to some degree, even Kirk and Gary Mitchell. It was one episode, but I like kind of felt it by the yeah. end. Yeah. Way back when, uh, oh, so it's 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 in Trek's DNA to talk about those things. But like another, another thing that we get with Soji is that apparently she likes French fries dipped in peppermint ice cream. A little bit and odd. That also uh, made me feel like I was watching Doctor Who, <laughs> the fish sticks and custard. Yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> said, French fries and milkshakes is a pretty a pretty standard quirky uh, thing that I know I know many people who like that. But Did you is, just say standard quirky thing? Uh, actually, I, that is exactly <laughs> how I think of it. That's not like... It's not That's quite paradox, normal. But, you, uh, how could it be standard and quirky at the same time? <laughs> uh, I think there's a, there's a, some... Uh, there's standardized quirks. Standardized. Uh, I'm going to say... The ones that come in the GURPS book. If you <laughs> yes. look at the quirk list, there it's already in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to accept that it's uh, somewhat... Um, what's, the, what's, what's the word you said? It was... Uh, Paradoxical, but yeah. yeah. All right, let's uh, but let's move on. <laughs> Where I, th- I think oxymoronic might be a better sure, yeah. description. You just wanted to get moronic in there. Um, it's that too. <laughs> like most of the shit you say, uh, but we get that uh, conversation at like the the mess hall table. Where they they lay all the cards out on the deck. This uh, is the whole crew essentially. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So everyone knows. Okay, two hundred to three hundred thousand years ago. There was this first synth shit that happened. Um, now we are at like that same threshold where something uh, super sinister might show up and torture us all to death or whatever's going to happen. And, uh, you know, it's so frightening. It makes uh, eight out of ten Romulans murder themselves instantly. <laughs> yeah. Raffi also explains to everyone, okay, so I got this figured out. I got, I got her number, Commodore O., Half Romulan infiltrator. She engineered the attack on Mars. This explains everything I've been trying to piece together for years. Uh, Mars was an inside job. <laughs> and um, do, do we assume that before the end of the episode, Picard took the time to call Starfleet and say, Oh, Ad- uh, uh, Clancy, you might want to know <laughs> about Commodore O. You know, it's the kind of thing that I can imagine a, a sort of almost triple cross sequence wherein... Uh, those ships show up to help them uh, at the Octonary Star mm-hmm. System, the the Federation or Star. They're not, go, they're not going to the Octonary Star System. They're going to the Synth World. Oh right, right. Yeah. They but they show up to help. Then they reveal to be traitor because O was in on it. And then uh, Picard is like, "You didn't think that I wasn't going? You know that I was just going to let that information just lie there." And then they have the prefix codes or whatever, and they yeah. turn <laughs> off our ships. Not that precisely, but I could see something like that occurring. I mean, it seems. Like, wildly irresponsible for Picard to not pass on to Clancy, oh, by yeah. the way, don't trust anything O says. Unless it's yeah. uh, dramatically satisfying to hold or, that, to just not show it. Or they could just write that they're out of communication range, and he wasn't but able they, to warn anybody. But they, they'd called them earlier. Yeah, but now they're further away. Or they also go through a transport conduit. He's not going to pay for long distance. <laughs> <laughs> no, before they go through the conduit. I, that's but, what I was, was asking. Well, let's talk about that. Where, like, Soji... Like, the more information she gets, the more uh, kind of OP she becomes. Right. Uh, she does a data type move. Yeah, she locks out everyone else from the ship and uh, takes control and sets a course for her, her home world. They, they don't have time to go to Deep Space 12. They, they need to go... Uh, help her people. I have felt that way for like two or three episodes mm-hmm. that, uh, that I'm like, we know that the Romulans are know where the place is. You got to get there. You got to hurry up. <laughs> I, so good job, Soji. I <laughs> loved how Rios took back control of his ship. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, he sang like he, some Spanish lullaby. Or yes, something, right? that was the best that's code actual, ever. That's an actual lullaby. Yeah, like yeah. I, I, I typed some of the lyrics into Google. And it came I, out I read that somewhere, but I didn't read what the what what it meant. But I, I just love ten out of ten for style. So much better than Alpha Pi, you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever. So his ship has texture and character. It is yes. not a. Uh, he is not Starfleet no. every in, in everything he does. No, while they're they're on course to the uh, to the the synth world. Um, we get like that goofy uh, moment with Picard, where like he's like, "No, like act- Soji has the right idea here. This is what we should be doing." And he tries to take the captain's chair mm-hmm. and then work the controls, but then he's like, "Oh, I actually don't know how to work this." He he's like, like, "I don't know how to do the Googles." Yeah, <laughs> it, it was like a like a, a boomer trying to like uh, use Netflix or something. Yeah, 
That was the one point where it's like, this is supposed to be funny, but I'm not laughing. I'm oh, just bored. I thought it was a little too goofy, but I, 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 I was still okay with it. I kind of I, always liked the idea of people like, you know, the, the kind of, I, I suppose, the big icons of Trek. Yeah. That they kind of keep up, you know, Scotty keeps up with technical journals. And Picard would know at least basics of yeah. new developments of, of ship. Yeah. Of piloting and the navigation, but it was like when we saw his house when he his replicator at home that he got his decaf Earl Grey from. Yeah, had like the old school TNG era L cars, whereas Dodge's replicator has like all the cool holographic interface. Yeah. The, the modern. It wasn't that stuff. it was unbelievable. I just thought the joke didn't land, and in an episode that where every other piece of dialogue is a is a beautiful gem. I was like, and especially since it came right after one of my favorite Picard moments about let's try doing it her way, <clears throat> which I was, yes. I thought was incredibly powerful with all everyone shoving her around. Picard's the one who realizes maybe what we need to do is let her decide our choice, yeah. make the choice. I really liked that. And then right after that, we get this kind of, Star Trek Five joke. Yeah, yeah, I kind of agree. Not a not a huge drawback from the episode. Would have been nicer if it had A landed or B not been there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I like the uh conversation we get between Picard and Rios here. I guess like the like the third like uh big Picard one on one conversation with someone in the episode. Mm -hmm. And uh really start off Picard's just reflecting on how he uh as as a young officer loved being uh, yeah. uh, alone on the bridge of a ship, staring off into the emptiness of space, and they kind of have like this this shared. You know, the, both these guys were were working in command in Starfleet, uh, so they, they they probably have a, a lot of relatability, a lot of overlap mm -hmm. as far as some of that stuff goes. And they they get in a conversation about uh, Alonzo Vandermeer and uh, how how Rios Rios is former him. captain, yeah. That and. But, but Picard says that he felt that what he knew of Vandermeer was that he was a good man. Yeah, and, and this is when, what, what you had mentioned earlier, Brian, where, where Rio says, like, yeah, I wish the guy, you know, didn't feel like Starfleet had, had betrayed him. But this is where Picard says, uh, oh, well, no, Starfleet, Starfleet did betray us. You know, even though this, uh, this Mars uh, massacre uh, was uh, part of a... A, uh, Inside job. Yeah, a Romulan um, scheme, a, Ro a Romulan plot. Uh, Starfleet still took the bait and did the wrong thing and gave in to fear. Right. Yeah. Uh, I like him uh, sort of... Uh, well, he's still kind of talking about Starfleet like he wasn't Starfleet. You know, I mean, I, he objected, obviously. Yeah, that, that's, but, that's when he resigned. But I, did, yeah, I appreciate him sort of acknowledging that the, the organization he was a part of still bears culpability to it and that it was because they had kind of abandoned their ethos. Yeah, and we, we should be willing to hold our... More than willing, we should feel obligated to hold our mm. institutions accountable. Absolutely. Um, and he also says that, uh, you know, the, the, the Romulans, their, uh, their tools are fear and secrecy and how the, the right way to counter that is not to give in to the fear, but with, uh, with openness and optimism. And, you know, because Rios has, like, some legit concerns. He's like, did you see what that girl just did taking over my ship like that? Like, this is really dangerous. This is scary. Like, a whole planet of these people. And Picard is like, uh, no, like, like we need to, like, give them a shot. We need to to, to do the hard thing and, and do the right thing. And uh, it's a, it's a, it, was a, it was a really good statement of purpose moment when for he's, him. When he goes critical about, like, the, the Romulan way of, of fear, I was ready to him to, like, go into, like, the... The fear is the mind killer speed <laughs> from uh, another Patrick Stewart sci-fi <laughs> thing, which was Dune. But, um, but yeah, he says fear is actually the great destroyer, mm -hmm. not some synth chick. Yep, that's legit. And I like how he counterpointed it with what the Federation Starfleet ethos has with um, curiosity. Yeah. Or at the very least, what it should be. Yes. So we end things with uh, their uh, arrival... At Soji's homeworld, we also see, uh, apparently Narek's ship does have a cloaking device. I don't know why he didn't use it earlier, but his ship decloaks uh, the snakehead ship. Yeah. So, uh, Narek is there, and we know that Narissa is on her way. Uh, yep. Probably She didn't go the trans-warp way, so it's probably taking her a little longer. <laughs> but, um, do what do y'all think about these remaining two episodes? Do you have any... Uh, big predictions or hopes or fears. It just occurs to me that, you know, Disco had its big battle sequence at the end of season two. And 
I guess did season one. No, no season really... one, season ended, ended with them putting the bomb in yeah. Kronos. Season two was the had the big uh, showdown in it. I would say too um, big. I, I agree, and uh, since Picard's greatest strength seems to be in those scenes where characters converse, uh, I'm a little bit worried about too much pew pew. Uh, at the same time, I'm kind of always like Star Trek pew pew. <laughs> um, I'm ready so, for some pew pew. Yeah, I'm you know, ready. It, We've earned the pew pew. It could want, be it could be pretty cathartic depending on how it plays I out. I don't want every season to end in kind of like a generic TV big action packed two parter. Sort of like yeah, Buffy always going up against the big bad yeah. or whatever. Yeah, like you can you can get a little overly familiar. They did take some. They def- definitely have taken cues from some of the Trek movies and things. Uh, the new, including the newer ones, and that does require that you end with a big action sequence. So. um... Not but if they all could, the time. I don't know, like most of the movies do. It's not Star Trek IV. <laughs> well, you didn't have to go back too far for that one. It does still have what a big you mean? There were two ships fighting each other at the end of Star Trek IV. It was a whaling ship and a bird of prey, <laughs> but they, they were still exchanging yeah, fire. It was <laughs> one, one harpoon fire shot. Essentially, their action sequence, they did the uh, Ocean's Eleven. They did a heist uh, instead of an action sequence, which, um, huge credit to them, actually. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great, memorable sequence throughout, and it's really more about a heisty now, kind of escape. The uh, kind of like the ship nerd in me, though, as much as I say, like, I don't need a big fleet battle, I do want to see the squadron of starships. <laughs> And they I'm, could do it without overdoing it. They got two episodes to spread it out here. It's almost like just me having like uh, all this time to think about it. With uh, I don't know if that's going to be in the first part or second part or split into both, but with one to two weeks to think about this, uh, I, I'm worried that it, I can't think about it too much because it's not going to live up to my my uh, whatever <laughs> I imagine in my head. Because I'm thinking like, wouldn't it be so cool if like when these ships show up, we get like some surprise help? What if we get? Uh, Captain Crusher on the USS Pasteur, and Captain LaForge on the USS Challenger, and then Captain Riker, he's, he, he's come out of retirement on, like, the USS Titan. And then they're like, oh, is the general gonna make it here too? And then all of a sudden, like, Worf shows up on this big badass Klingon battle cruiser <laughs> that we've never seen before. And, and they, they have, like, this big battle with the, the Tal Shiar. Um, Father, you know, you've it for the... everyone. Yeah. Um, Man, That's uh, exactly the sort of cameos I wish we'd gotten at the end of the Dominion War on DS9. But you know, I saw to go uh, off on a tangent. But. I saw like a set photo recently where Lavar Burton was visiting the set, and I so was, was like, Michael Dorn, and I was like, "Huh, that's interesting." Yeah, <laughs> let me let me just tell you, if they did what you did, I would explode. <laughs> like it would be the coolest ever. Well, and I hope I would they like, do it then, because then I get to have like that cool moment and get rid of you at the same time. <laughs> If I tell you what, if they pull off that or something pretty close to it, I forgive them and even encourage the death of Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. It was. It'd be worth sacrificing a Hugh to yeah, get that to get a cool scene with Doctor Crusher and all the rest showing up. Um, bye oh, bye Hugh. And what if they also have like a refit Enterprise, like a Sovereign class that's like been like upgraded with three nacelles and a big phaser cannon. I don't like the triple the cells. I, 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 <laughs> I, I thought that ship was. But they they could potentially do something really cool here. Yeah, uh, that's that's on them. Uh, on the other hand, if they do some battling and a lot of talking, I will also be down with this probably. And um, I think that's all we have time for as far as predictions. Yep. But if you have any, be sure to let us know. And also, if you have any thoughts or comments on this episode in particular, let us know. We might mention it soon. And uh, I'm also going to run through all the Gorn eggs, our Star Trek Easter eggs in this episode. And if I miss any, there's something that you caught that I didn't, let us know that as well. well we should, we should, I, I see you've got a big list, so let's like, let's just knock them out. Let's yeah, hit we're going to go through this fast and furious, I guess. <laughs> uh, that's funny to me and Dave, because he likes those movies, I've never seen any of them. We're going to do this I Fate of the Furious. Stupid. We're going to do okay. this Fast Five. We're going to do... We're going to do this Tokyo Drift. Let's go. So first up, Nerissa uses the line, resistance is futile. The Borg catch phrase that we heard for the first time back in QQ. Last thing a lot of people probably heard in their lives. Uh, well, they live as Borg after that. But, That's true. Uh, I guess sometimes they get blown up like Jennifer Sisko, though. <laughs> uh, when Picard is talking to Admiral Clancy, he mentions that it turns out the windmills are giants. This is a uh, reference to Don Quixote, which was like... The first uh, modern novel? Uh, yeah, that's how I often feel it, uh, des- hear it described by Cervantes. 
Uh, having an engineer with a Scottish accent is obviously a tip of the hat to Scotty from the original series. And uh, this has been done a lot, like when Lorca did his, his uh, engineer guys in Discovery in the Mirror Universe, yep. or when they had that, uh, on short tracks, when they had that uh, woman engineer on the Enterprise who had a Scottish accent. Yep. Um, in fact, it seems uh, really weird that there's so many Scottish engineers in Starfleet, so I think they should stop with that. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, probably not one to run with. I, again, If I, I still kind of enjoyed all the Rioses in this one, so... Uh, I'm going to let it slide because they were fun as a group. The hospitality hologram mentions Uridian T. We know the race of Uridians from first introduced in the next generation. They are a race of like information brokers. Um, and apparently they drink tea. Now, uh, when we see Rios's cabin, he's got a collection of books. He is super into existential philosophy. Uh, the, these books include a, uh, a lot of, of real life books, including the one we've saw him reading before, The Tragic Sense of Life. And a really cool book here, we see Sorak and Existentialism. So he's also uh, reading philosophy from the uh, father of uh, Vulcan logic. Yeah, that's a, that was a cool cut. Mm-hmm. The registry number of the Ibn Majed is NCC75710. I really like that because it makes sense for it to have been built uh, around the same time or shortly after the Intrepid class ships like Voyager or the Defiant class ships like the Defiant from DS9. Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminded me of how Michael Okuda always paid a lot of attention to registry numbers. So that, that and, registry number fits in with like where they were around the... Uh, yeah, or short, shortly after. That. Or we, Given yeah. the limited but, data we have. Obviously, if it shows yeah. up and it's an old Constitution class, then we're going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because we saw the shape of it. Yeah. And it, it, it looked kind of like uh, a John Eves design for the DS9 documentary, What We Left Behind, for a, uh, when they did the, a, the uh, hypothetical eighth season of DS9, and he had a ship in there named the Emmett Till. And it's kind of a similar shape to that. So I'm, sh- I'm sure John Eves designed this one. I know he has worked on Picard. Uh, the emergency medical hologram mentions his Hippocratic coding. Uh, of course, on Voyager, we learned that the uh, emergency medical hologram on that show was also programmed to follow the Hippocratic Oath. Raffi refers to a vinyl record player as a Walkman. <laughs> uh, that was uh, like back when I was a kid, the mobile cassette player that I think... Some people alive today probably never heard of. Yeah. So I think it's like really weird that Rafi, even though like she totally mistook it for something else, would even be familiar with that term. Uh, uh, again, I felt like I was watching Doctor Who because they referred to a jukebox as an iPod in one of the episodes <laughs> of Doctor Who. So, <laughs> Same kind of gag, yeah. Yeah, very, very similar. But that's fine. <laughs> one of Nerissa's subordinates is referred to as a centurion. Uh, this is a traditional Romulan rake that has been used ever since the Romulans first appeared in the original series in Balance of Terror. Uh, when Seven of Nine is tapped into the Borg Collective, uh, she utters the phrase, We are Borg, in the Borg voice, kind of like a little distortion, but sounds like many voices speaking, which is a super cool effect that they first established when the Borg first showed up. And it's so cool that they got that right on the first try, and the Borg have always kind of had like that... That, that sinister, ominous, collective voice ever since then. That'd be Q-Who? Yes. Rios mentions Zephyr and Cochran and Warp Drive. This is referring to uh, both the event and the movie First Contact. Mm-hmm. Raffi refers to the diplomats as being from a strange new world, talking about beautiful flower and Jana. Strange new world, of course, being uh, originally heard in Star Trek in... The, uh, the opening William Shatner monologue in the original series. Yep. Soji is able to use the transwarp conduit network that we know that the Borg used in Voyager and also in uh, Descent Part 1 and 2. They had uh, Borg using uh, uh, transwarp corridors to get about uh, the galaxy. And she mentions a, a the nearest transwarp node. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, the implication in Voyager was that um, the, uh, the trans, the Borg transwarp network was damaged or possibly destroyed, but we know that Borg do regenerate and they adapt. So it's apparently been, uh, at least partially rebuilt. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also learned that Nerissa has a rank, that she is a colonel in this episode. And what we know about the Tal Shiar is that they use, 
uh, kind of like army ranks, like a colonel or major. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that it was that's, that was used in uh, Face of the Enemy on Next Generation. Uh, I'm gonna call her Colonel Rizzo. Um, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in Face of the Enemy on Next Generation, Troy was disguised as a Tal Shiar major, and then in the DS9 episode, the die is cast. We get a Tal Shiar colonel. Picard mentions that uh, one of the early ships he served on was the USS Reliant. This, of course, is not the one that blew up in the Matara Nebula. Uh, but uh, another Reliant, and... It didn't uh, technically get blown up. Just got... It got blown up. It got disassembled and put back together into new uh, things. The, <laughs> uh, but, but the disassembling, I would I think, falls under the umbrella of blowing up. When you beam up. somebody up, you don't say they've blown them up. So. <laughs> well, it, like, expanded out, and then... I guess like the Genesis Matrix pulled everything back in. See, this is like uh, when you correct me about the Borg cube, Borg's getting sucked out. This is what it feels like, Father. <laughs> Feel the pain. No, it doesn't. It's not really painful. <laughs> He's just gonna cut it out. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> but the the reason why this is notable is because in a deleted scene from uh, the Bruce Maddox episode, Measure, Measure of a Man, TNG season two. Um, and when Picard's talking to the Admiral, he actually mentioned something about the uh, the USS Reliant. That when they did the HD remaster of that episode and they added that scene back in, mm-hmm. um, they, they included that. So th- this was a cool little like deep cut that uh, Michael Chabon is apparently familiar with the extended version of Measure of a Man. Picard says he knew Alonzo Vandermeer through the, a captain that he had served under. Alonzo Vandermeer was the first officer to Captain Marta Batanitas. That was actually the character we saw in the TNG episode Tapestry. That uh, was Picard's friend at the Academy that he said, oh yeah, we always kind of liked each other. And then like when Q took him back in time, let him relive that over again. Mm-hmm. He, he actually like got to sleep with her this time. Um, which... Wouldn't that be nice if we could all like go back in time and pick up every missed opportunity that we've had? I thought you were going to say, wouldn't it be nice if we could all go back in time and sleep with Marta Batanides? Uh, that too. She was <laughs> that a, would actually be forward in time. She but... was a, a good-looking woman, as I recall. <laughs> but, and uh, turns into Q by the next morning. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, that, that part would be a little freaky. But, Classic uh, Q. <laughs> so I thought that was so cool to reference her here. That yeah. uh, and I like the idea that most Starfleet captains know each other, or at least have heard of each other. Like, mm. I, I don't like the idea of like Starfleet being like so big that like, I, I that always vast bureaucracy. Yeah, I always pictured it as like one or two thousand ships. Mm. Even though that one time on Discovery, they're like, we have like twenty thousand ships or something ridiculous. Like the registry number doesn't even go up that high. Yeah. But, uh, anyways, um, they were obviously counting shuttlecrafts. <laughs> Yeah, I like I like that idea that it's 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 a little bit of a commu- it's a it's a large community, but it's small enough that like most captains know each other or at least have heard of each other. Yeah, I dig that. Um, so uh, that's again all the Easter eggs I had. If you had any, let us know. And also, I had it- a couple. Oh, oh, what does Brian have? Well, one of them, the uh, they mentioned that they don't they've lost all the uh, Medusa navigation charts. I forgot to write that down. Yeah, but yes, yes. Um, who we know from the. TOS episode season three, uh, something about beauty. Is, is there in truth no beauty? Yeah. Right. Um, I th- like that title. That episode title needs a comma somewhere. I'm not sure where. <laughs> uh, is there in truth no beauty? Uh, yeah, they were uh, really good navigators. Yeah. Also, a lot like the Zotvash abnomission. Uh, when you see what uh, Medusa looks like, it's so ugly it drives you insane. <laughs> that's it's a good point. Uh, what else did you have, Brian? Um, it, it's a little it, hazy, but the in um, uh, Girardi says she's never been part of a crew before, mm-hmm. and that really to me harkened back to Star Trek Beyond. And Scotty ex- explained to, explaining to Jayla what it means to be part of a crew and how nobody's mm-hmm. going to get left behind. And I was very happy to see Star Trek Beyond get a little bit of love. Oh, um, I wasn't expecting continuity references from a different timeline to yeah, make Yeah, yeah, we don't usually see uh, Easter eggs from the Kelvin verse. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. I'm not convinced that Michael Chabon was referencing that intentionally. But, but, but it's an interesting catch-on yeah. theme. It, it, I, I was happy to hear Agnes Tarati 
already say that she, for the first time, felt like she's part of a crew. Because mm-hmm. for a while, I thought she was going to say part of a family. And I'm like, ah, oh, don't do that. That's going to be corny. But then when she said crew, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a crew. We're seeing this crew gel. Yeah. The Star Trek is about uh, people being uh, a crew on a ship yeah. more often than not. So it's cool that we see that here. Yeah, but Star Trek Beyond was the one that explicitly spelled that out, which is something that's been generally more inferred by most Star Trek. Um, and then my favorite, my favorite Easter egg um, was discovering that she, uh, that uh, Gerardi had injected herself with viridium, which was... I didn't write the, that one down either. Which so was the was special substance from Star Trek VI that Spock stuck on the back of Kirk that could be detected from several yeah. sectors away. Oh. And so ever since then I was like, this. there's this cool stuff that even a little bit of it can be picked up from light years away, and that's a really interesting, cool idea. Yeah, I, I'm kicking myself for not... Uh, Including that in my notes, I was totally thinking of it last night. But... I squeed so much when they said viridium in that. Yeah, episode. yeah, I was, I was giddy to hear that because it also kind of makes the viridium patch make more sense, which always <laughs> seemed kind of weird yeah. how effective it was at, at yeah. tracking someone across Klingon space. I mean, um, I'm not sure if it's any less silly now, but at least there's there's a continuity of this is a yeah. thing that's part of the universe. Yeah, well, that makes it a more valid, and it's like a recurring thing. I yeah. think, or to me, it does. Yes. Um, but uh. Th- yeah, thank you for including that stuff that, that I forgot. Uh, I appreciate that because I would have felt really bad if I was editing this together and then realized <laughs> that I had forgotten to mention Viridium. Oh, um, and uh, I, I, I love uh, shout outs to Star Trek Six. Yeah, I'm going to miss Michael Chabon when he's no longer the showrunner because <laughs> he does all this cool things that use the existing continuity and I don't want to lose that. I love it. And he does it in a fairly intelligent way. It's not just, oh, look, triple! So, you know, like, like say, Kelvin Universe or, or uh, yeah. Discovery sometimes. Well, did. hopefully there will be uh, some... Uh, the, the, they will catch his momentum and carry it. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. So we're not going to have time for any subspace transmissions this week. But uh, still, please let us know what you thought of the, this episode. And we'll hopefully be able to bring that up uh, next time when we discuss... Uh, next week's episode, the penultimate episode, named after the famous French painting, Et in Arcadia Ego. Which, French painting, Latin phrase? Uh, yes. Um, which, uh, kind of implies that, uh, death is everywhere. Hmm. Um, so, is someone gonna die in the ending? Yeah, man. Uh, I guess we'll find out, but until then, as always, live, live long, long and, and prosper, prosper y'all. y'all. Listen to the Text Trek podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or at text-trek.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash text-trek, and follow Fathery on Twitter at txtrek. Please support us by liking our videos and subscribing to our channel on YouTube. Thank you, and take care.